This is a simple file upload service, but of course it can be hacked. All that this web application is, is a carriage return line feed converter or CRLF. If you aren't familiar, there are different kinds of line endings for plain text on your computer. There's a carriage return line feed, which is most commonly found on Windows operating systems and just a new line, which you typically see on Linux or Mac based operating systems. Let me show you, say I were on Windows and I just created a new simple text file. We can call that file from Windows and I'll double click to open it in Notepad and I can enter anything I want. Hello world, maybe uh, please subscribe, right? I'll go ahead and save this file, control S on my keyboard. And now I'll hop over to my Kali Linux virtual machine where I'll go ahead and open up a folder. I'll move into a directory for us to work in and let me just paste that file in. Alongside that, I wanna open up a terminal and I'll move into that same directory and I'll create another file just like it. We'll say from linux.txt. Here we'll go ahead and do the exact same thing. We'll save that file. Now both of these files exist in the current directory and I can display them out. We can cat out, oh, from Linux and there is the text that we would expect. We can do the exact same thing from Windows and they are identical files. However, we aren't seeing all the details here because the new line characters or the line feed, they aren't displayed. They're not printable. It's just like dropping down a new line, right? Let me show you again, but with a different argument. I'll use cat tat capital A so we can display all the characters from that from Linux file, right? Now you can see these dollar signs here that represent a new line character. Hey, we hit enter, we hit the return key on our keyboard and we've dropped a new line line down. Let me show you that exact same thing with our from Windows file. And you'll see that there is a caret capital M right in front of all of the other dollar signs for the new line characters. That is our carriage return line feed or the backslash R kind of escape character that you see sometimes coupled with the backslash N, usually just referring to a new line character. Now over on Linux, there is this super duper handy utility called DOS to Unix. It's a command line application that you can run and pass in a file that you want to convert. Say that from Windows file that we did, we convert it to Unix format. And now with that, if I were to cat out the from windows.txt file again. Again, no special characters without the tag A, it looks just fine. But if I were to cat tag A from windows.txt, now our caret M characters are gone, the backslash R line feed is no longer present, and it's just using the backslash and new line character as you would expect on Linux. So with all that background, that is all that this web application, the CRLF converter really does. Let me actually paste in and replace the previous from windows.txt file. Now, if I display that again, we have our backslash R characters again present. And there's no secret sauce here. Seriously, if I go browse to that file from windows.txt, upload it, that is all that this CRLF converter does. Now we can download that file. I'll head back to the command line and move from my downloads that from Windows file, uh, and we'll add that CRLF ending at the end there. Now, if I were to cat that out, displaying that onto the screen, it has done the work for us. All our web application is, is just a wrapper around the DOS to Unix command line tool. But you might be thinking, oh, just calling back to a command line utility, that might be vulnerable, maybe command injection. And you might remember, I said, this can be hacked. In fact, this is one of the challenges that I created for the Sneak Fetch the Flag CTF that I co-hosted with Sneak just previously. And I gotta say, this is my personal favorite challenge. I really love this one. I think there's just kind of a neat trick here. No hardcore exploits or elite stuff, but just some clever trickery with command line tooling. Hey, congratulations to all the winners. Thanks so much for everyone that played. And if you're interested in not just this video write-up, but you wanna see some others, there is a link in the video description to all the other write-ups and solutions for all the challenges from the sneak fetch the flag. And we gotta see at the very end of the video, sneak can probably help solve this challenge. It can find the vulnerability. And if you are interested in how you might be able to use sneak to find vulnerabilities in your own code projects and applications, link in the video description. Huge thanks to sneak for sponsoring this video and letting me co-host the CTF with them. Now here is the challenge prompt. All we need to do is retrieve the flag out of the root user's home directory. Okay, a little bit interesting, but look, we are given some files here. So let's dig into that and see what the players were provided for this challenge. 
I have that in my current directory here, the crlf.zip file. Let's go ahead and unzip that and we can see, oh, we have the application. Seemingly everything inside of that app directory, we have the source code app.py, maybe some of the required modules and the templates for the front end HTML and the uploads directory, probably where things get staged as they are uploaded. Since we are given the source code of the application, this is like white box testing, right? The map is illuminated, we can see what we are up against and we can understand all that it does because we can read the source code. That's opposed to like, oh, a black box test where you don't exactly know what you're up against. You're just kind of bumping around the dark, trying things until you see something fall over. This is ideal because we have the application source code. So let's open it up and see what we are up against. So it's a Python file, right? We're using Flask as our little micro web framework here. We define the application, maybe get a secret key in action, stage the uploads folder and create that if it does not exist. And then we have the functionality of the homepage. Looks like it supplies different HTTP methods or it handles them appropriately. And what I actually wanna do is ignore this post method for just a second, because ultimately if that's not provided and we just have a get request, then it retrieves all the files in the upload folder and presumably passes them to the template to be displayed on the screen. That's just like we saw here in the previously converted files. Hey, that's what we uploaded just a moment ago. There is a route to be able to download any of the files from the upload folder. That's hey, clicking the link for that file we just converted. And of course, just running the application, look at that port 5000 internally and debug mode is on. That is actually really important to note because we might be able to access like that slash console endpoint and we could get to the work zug debug console where we could actually maybe run Python commands and gain code execution that way. Bear in mind that requires a pin, which we won't know because the server is running on that end, but maybe we can find some vulnerabilities to potentially grab enough information and determine what the pin is. Let's table that for now though, because we should go back and review how this post methodology happens here. What's the process and procedure when we actually try to upload something? So we retrieve the files, maybe selected files that we supply. Make sure that you actually did provide some files. Otherwise it processes them with a little list comprehension and then starts to stage them into the upload folder. This is the most important part. First, we start with an empty list of file names, and then we loop through all the files that we're processing. We go ahead and grab the base name of the file. We go ahead and join that with the upload folder location, so we know where to store it on the file system. We add the file name to the list of files that we're building, and we try to save that file that we have inside of our upload folder. Then we go ahead and actually build a string here where we join all of the file names together and then add them to the command DOS to Unix as you saw us run on the command line. We'll go ahead and execute that command passed in with subprocess.run and then return whether or not it succeeded or if it errored. Now, let me ask you, I don't know, like write it in the comments or whatever, but do you see the vulnerability right away? At first blush, hey, right off the bat, can you see the problem here? Obviously stuff going into subprocess.run, especially containing some of our user input is probably bad. That might be sketch, but we're actually putting this all together with schlex.split. Isn't that normally pretty safe? And we did of course actually grab the base name of the file. So it's not like you can use any dot dot slash uh, climbing the file system, right? There's no directory traversal there, but take another closer look at that section. This os.path.baseName function call is gonna be stored in the file name variable, but that file name variable is never actually used. It's all being referenced. Whenever we actually need to retrieve the file name, it comes out of the uploaded object, file.filename. Every single call when we're building the upload folder location path and appending this all to the file names, it's not actually grabbing the base name or just the simple file name that's provided. That means we could provide even an absolute path to something else on the file system. And you might already be really well familiar with GTFO bins or all these Linux and Unix based binaries that can do some unique special things like read arbitrary files or write to files or create a new shell, maybe a new terminal session or abuse privileges and permissions like a set UID or group user ID. These are the living off the land tricks for native binaries, programs and applications over here on the Linux side. So we could simply search for DOS to Unix and we can see it right there. There is some capability with file write. 
where we might be able to actually write data to files. Here they use some special syntax. They stage some variables like lfile1 or lfile2 for files that you want to read from and then files that you want to write to. And this is provided with the dos to unix command but with other arguments tack f and tack n with the files provided. Question though, what are the tack n and tack f arguments? What do those parameters do? Well, let's get back to our terminal and let's try to check out the dos to unix man page. We might be able to kind of take a look. Oh, looks like tack n actually allows us to supply an out file rather than just modifying the file in place, like we saw with our from windows.txt file, it'll actually put it to a different file. So maybe we could actually kind of copy the contents of one file to another location. That was tack n, but what is tack f? I'm gonna hit the forward slash on my keyboard to search. Looks like there are some other results for it. So let me move down and forward slash again to find it. Okay, yeah, tack f is simply force. It will work with binary files just as well. So we can control the contents of different files. And remember we saw the gimmick that we could supply an absolute path for any other file. So looking back at the code here, the file names that we provided, they actually get added onto the dos to unix command that's ran from the shell. So maybe this is a little bit weird, but we could do like command injection based off the file names that we provide with this upload service. Let's go ahead and start to build this out. Let's write a script. I can call this, I don't know, like playground.py. We'll add a shebang line, user bin environment python 3. Let's import requests to be able to work with this. And I am running this locally. So I'll define a variable localhost where I can just access that localhost port 5000. We'll make sure that's an HTTP schema and we'll just add that on. Now let's try to make this abstract and useful for us. So let's start to define just some building block functions, right? Let's create like an upload to server and we can say uh, files provided that as an argument, right? Now you might remember when we were actually interacting with this application, if we were to try and upload files, we might even be able to actually supply multiple files. So I could click these and you actually had checkboxes for what you wanted to actually upload and have processed. So we could supply multiple files here. With that in mind, we kind of need to build out a couple different lists. We need the files to upload that can start as an empty list and then the selected files that can also be an empty list. Now from our files, maybe what we provide to this function, we'll have the file name and the file contents. We can abstractly define these in Python just to make the, our lives easier. Here's kind of that idea. Maybe we had a files list that was actually a list of tuples, right? Where we had the file name dot text, txt, and then maybe bytes for the contents of the file. Now, if these are defined as bytes, that B prefix, we probably want to work with the IO module and the bytes IO. That way we can abstractly work with these in memory. Now this is simple, coming together with that idea of our files variable, we could check for the file name and file contents in the files that are provided as the argument to this function. We can actually grab the file content specifically by using the bytes IO constructor around the file contents. Now we have to actually stage the files to upload list and we can append this and we'll kind of put in what we might expect for the HTTP post parameter as we're actually uploading that file. Now we'll need to know the name of the variable and I'm actually gonna put this together as a tuple where file is the name of the HTTP parameter and then we'll grab the file name and the file content. That should work just fine for us, but now we'll go ahead and add the selected files, add to that list for our file name, because that should be all that's necessary for the selected files parameter as we're uploading to our service. Now that all of that data is staged, we can go ahead and make our post request with requests. Uh, we'll go ahead and say the response can equal the requests module, that library that we imported in. We'll go ahead and post to our URL. Uh, and let me make sure that that is actually uh, included or accessible with the function. We'll just make that a simple global variable. And remember in the source code, we didn't need any specific other endpoint. It's just posting to the URL, but we will need the files to be provided. And we'll include our files to upload sort of tuple that we've been building out alongside our data for the post parameters where we can supply our selected files. That should do the magic here, but now let's go ahead and make sure that we can go ahead and return our response.txt just to see the output. Now we've got our first building block, but let's try to test it and debug as we're working along. 
down at the bottom, let's see if we can try to run our upload to server files that we've defined just up above. That should add a file name.txt and the contents of the file. We can actually just store that uh, response and let's see if we can print that out. Maybe we don't need to return .txt, we can just pull it out as we retrieve it. Uh, let's see. I'll go ahead and hit control B on my keyboard to run this within Sublime Text. And ooh, I do have an error. Too many values to unpack when trying to encode some of the fields necessary. Selected files should still be a uh, uh, tuple just as well because that parameter name needs to be uh, selected files, I believe. And we can see that in the source code of our application. If I open up the app.py one more time. Yeah, selected files is pulling from the list of selected files and file here just as well. Let me try to run that one more time, but that's why we are testing, developing here. Okay, we have a response and this is just the HTML of the web page. So let me go back to the page and I'll refresh let me hit F5 on my keyboard, and there it is. There is our file name.txt. So we have a working proof of concept to upload via Python in an automated way. Now we can start to experiment. Let's try to test some of those theories, see if our hypothesis of, oh, can we use absolute paths, or even can we write to different files, will even work for us. Maybe we could try to read a file by moving or copying the contents into a location that we can then download and retrieve with our code. But there is something that we have to keep in mind. Remember, this DOS to Unix trick, the technique that we're using from GTF Obens, where we supply these TACF and TACN parameters, these arguments that we can literally supply as file names here, we are still gonna be writing files. So we might accidentally clobber stuff, right? We need to bear in mind that if we try to copy a file to a different location that we can then access by downloading it like we saw, we are still writing a file. In order to read files, we have to write files. However, what if we were to write to a file or try to reference one of those files that we didn't have write access to, right? Sorry, I'm saying write way too many times. Let's try to specify in our list of files here. Let's build out more tuples that we can supply for all of the selected files. Let's use our tacf that file name that we're genuinely providing as like a command line argument. We can say the file contents here, well, they literally don't matter, right? We could just call this the F file or something stupid. We'll supply the tack N here. Again, that's the one that's the most important because we supply an output location for the conversion. And let's say we want to actually supply the argument for our input here and then the output here. Let's say the input file and the output file. Now with this trick, let's try to take our input file, the one that we're reading from to try to convert, let's grab something weird like slash etc password. Just to test our theory, can we actually pull that content and then put it into a location that we might then be able to access, then be able to read, right? Now before we actually kind of fire that off, let's build out a, another quick function just to like download a file given a file name, right? We can use our request.get call given the URL. Let's add in the slash files and the file name that we want. I'll use an F string there with the simple curly braces. And then let's go ahead and return the response.txt. Now that that download file is built out along with the kind of upload file functionality, let's create just a simple convenience function for us called like read file based off of a file name where we'll use this files technique where we're passing that tack F and tack N parameter. Now the etc password file, that's really the file name that we want to access, right? And what we end up retrieving where we put that is kind of just a temporary file for us, right? That we'll end up downloading. So let's call that just a temporary file. And that can be, I don't know, output.txt, just like we have before. That way we can simply go ahead and place that there. But after we upload to the server within this function, let's try to go ahead and return us downloading the file of the temporary file where all of that is stored. Now we're using this as a specific example because we cannot write to etc password, but we're using this technique to read the file contents from it. Let's update our actual code to run here and let's go ahead and print out read file when we pass in etc password. Now I'm gonna cross my fingers, hope and pray. If I hit control B on my keyboard, let's run it. Yes, 
we got the output of the etc. password file. So we have basically arbitrary file read with a very specific caveat, right? It's not arbitrary because we cannot write to that file. The only reason we're able to read it is because we can't write to it. But this means we can now enumerate the file system, try to understand and make sense of this. We know that there is a CRLF user, maybe we could try to read all the contents of their home directory, see if they have any SSH keys or something like that. And at this point, if you really, really wanted to, because the application is running in debug mode, like I said, if you go to console, you could see, oh, the interactive kind of Python interpreter console that you could work with. We could now read out all of these sensitive files and determine the actual pin code to get into this debug console. But we don't need to do that because yes, we have arbitrary read sort of, but we have arbitrary file write. And one thing that happens when a Flask server is running in debug mode is that it will auto reload when it finds changes or modifications made to the source code. It'll just live kind of react and reload itself. So what if we could use our file read and file write combination to sort of poison or tamper with the actual source code to our CRLF converter? That is an awesome game plan. That can be our plan of attack, but we don't exactly know where it's living on the file system of the remote external server. Like sure, if I look back, hey, we were given the source code, we could go dig into that, but we weren't given the Docker file or the actual structure of how this application is deployed on that machine. But this is where we can use some clever tricks to find out everything that we need to know and how we can kind of tamper and modify this. We can update our script to not read etc. password, but let's read out of the slash proc file system. You know, that sort of folder in Linux and that location that can help you get some more information on different different processes running. In fact, we could read our proc self to denote this current running process, what we're actually working with, right? We could actually read out, oh, the command line or the current working directory. That is really just a sim link to, okay, the location of the file system that might be important. And self is that just as well. But what if we were to look at proc self status? I'll enter that, I'll hit control B to run it. We cannot write to that file, but we can read it. So we can see, ooh, we're actually running here as the DOS to Unix process, right? It converting, running in the background. And we know our PID or our process ID is 34, but our parent PID, our process ID is just number seven. That's probably Python, right? Like, sure, we could go ahead and check out, oh, the command line of this process that's running, but it is simply just DOS to Unix. It's us trying to run the command to do the conversion. What if I were to use that proc with the PID process ID of the parent process? Number seven, let me run this. User local bin Python app app.py. Perfect. That immediately tells us the location of the application. Now we know what to clobber and where. So this might be kind of a sensitive thing though, because we're clobbering the actual application. We don't really want to break it. We want it to still keep working as it did. But since we were given the source code, we could actually add some new functionality, right? What if we added a little back door and gave it a function to literally give us a reverse shell or allow us to run code, execute commands and have control of the server. Let's open up our app.py script and let me actually save a copy, maybe in the parent directory, but we can call this bad app.py. We'll go ahead and save that file and let's build out a whole new function, maybe a whole new route that we could use to get a reverse shell. So I am just gonna go online to revshells.com. Uh, I'm gonna scroll down to just grab the Python syntax. Really, it doesn't matter because honestly, hey, we can just shell out if we want here. Uh, but this syntax should be fine. We can copy and paste this and add it to our code. Let me add an app route where we can just get to maybe reverse shell. Let's define a reverse shell shell function. And then I think we can pull like an IP address from the flask request object with the args. And then we can get maybe a get parameter called IP. We'll do the exact same thing for trying to steal a port. Let me grab that and we'll check if IP, if not IP or not port like these don't exist, then we can simply return IP and port must be provided as get parameters. And then we can 
paste in the syntax for everything necessary to create a reverse shell in Python. Uh, let me clean out and clean up some of the little like white space or really just crammed all into one line here uh, where they're trying to get the R host and everything from an environment variable. Now we can just use our IP and our port and let's try to spawn bash rather than SH. I think that will work okay, work well for us here. Now that that is staged in our bad app.py file, we probably need to go ahead and define a new function for our exploit script to not read a file, but write a file. So let's write a file given the file name and file contents here. The file contents that we add as an argument are really the most important thing here. And we don't really care to download the file at the end of this, nor do we even need, oh, a temporary file, but I guess it's fine. So we no longer need to read from the proc file system to determine where the application is, but we can just try to write to a file given our slash app slash app.py. And let's go ahead and put in the contents where we open up our bad app.py locally, like on our machine. Uh, let's read that in bytes mode, so RB, and let's do a dot read so we have all the bytes of the file actually loaded in. And I think, fingers crossed, we can just run this uh, I'm gonna hit Control B on my keyboard and we'll see if it breaks the whole server or gives us new functionality. Control B, script finished. Let me go back to the application. We'll get out of the debug console, go back to the home page, and looking good. Okay, the page still loads. Nothing is broken. We can access it all. Can I get to slash reverse underscore shell? Yes, IP and port must be provided as get parameters. So we're good. We have used our file write capability to clobber the whole application, add the back door, and now we can make use of it to get a reverse shell and fully compromise control the machine. Let's go back and let's stage our own netcat listener. I'll listen on quad nine, but we could put this right on like any ngrok if we wanted to, put it out on the open internet. Let me check my current IP address. I guess I'm running through Docker, right? So that should be 172.17.01. Good. Now we could write this in Python or we can do it with curl where we can try to curl localhost HTTP colon slash slash the same port 5000 to get to our target. We'll go to our reverse shell endpoint. Let me add these parameters for our IP to equal that and our port to equal quad nine. Now I'll wrap these in single quotes so the ampersand things work A-OK -okay for us and fingers crossed the moment I hit enter on this We'll get a reverse shell on this terminal up above. Hey, hopefully, yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We've got a reverse shell. Now we have control of the machine. You can see that we landed in the app directory and this has app.py requirements, templates, uploads, everything. Really kind of funny. Hey, we could move into our uploads directory, see all the noise that we have here. <laughs> but let's not forget the challenge prompt said we need to get the flag out of the root user home directory. We are just the CRLF user that we saw in Etcetera password. So we need to do some privilege escalation. Thankfully, this shouldn't be too hard. You could upload linps, you could look for SUID binaries, SGID binaries as we did, uh, but truthfully, I just wanna keep this simple and easy for you. We had in the sudoers capability, this user could run without a password, user bin DOS box. You like that joke? You like that kind of gimmick I keep using of DOS and the DOS to Unix DOS box here? Now, thankfully, this is another living off the land trick. We can go check it out at the GTFO bins resource. All the things here would help us and we just use DOS to Unix, but let's see if it has anything for DOS box. Looks like it does, especially with sudo. Let me go see, let's learn how can we use this and abuse this to get a full shell. Okay, so we have a file to write presumably, and DOSBox mount C echo data into an L file. Etsy, does that work? Do we need a full shell though? Could we just try to read the file? We know it's in that file location in Root's home directory, right? So maybe file read would be a little bit easier for us. L file should be path to file read with backslashes. Mount C type C file, or oh, it's copied into a readable location. We can try one of those, I guess. Let me try to copy that. Let's stage this in our text editor first and the file that we wanna read should be root backslash flag dot text, right? Can I run that? And we do wanna use that with sudo, in which case uh, 
we probably don't need that set as a variable. I want that actually in the content here. So let's actually supply that in the command rather than using that L file prefix. Does that kind of make sense? Let's see it in action. Let's see if it'll work. Let me go paste this in. Uh, air opening terminal unknown. Does it not have a terminal? What if we export term? Set that as a variable X term. Can I run that now? How about enter? Oh, geez, what the heck is happening? What is this? What the heck is this? Is this supposed to be the DOS box prompt? I'm gonna hit control C. Oh no, now it just broke my shell. I'm gonna type in reset and fix that whole prompt. Okay, so that probably won't work because it's gonna get like interactive DOS box and inside a reverse shell, that kind of sucks. Let's um, start another netcat listener, run our curl command again to get back to that shell. And let's look back at the syntax here to see what we might be able to do instead. We have reading to a different location. Let's try that copy. Let me sudo that, and then our L file that we want is again, I think with the backslash syntax to root flag.txt. And let's just copy that to see if we can get that to run in the first place. We'll go ahead and paste. Now that we know that we can sudo DOSBox, error opening terminal unknown, okay, yeah, export term to X term one more time, so that should function for us. Uh, uh, did it work? Did it, let's cat temp output. Output, oh, I can't tab complete, dang it. Let's ls temp. We have an output file, we have an output file. Okay, uh, cat temp output. Yes, there is our flag and that challenge, CRLF, the carriage return line feed converter, is done. Hey, I hope you thought that was cool. I hope you thought that was kind of neat. I hope you thought that was a little bit clever kind of using this, oh, file write capability to do some file read moving into different locations, all with DOS to Unix with a regular, hey, maybe cutesy little living off the land or GTFO bin. And then even using DOS box as the pseudo or privilege escalation vector to try and read that file again out of a new moved readable location. Just thought it was kind of cool. Just thought it was neat. I hope that you had some fun with that challenge if you played. Again, this was my personal favorite. I was really, really pleased with how this came together. And uh, it was a lot of fun and a great opportunity to work with Sneak to co-host the Sneak Fetch the Flag competition. And you know what? Hey, look, is Sneak going to solve that? Would it find that vulnerability? Let me go back to the terminal here. I'll exit out of our reverse shell. <laughs> the, the view for the function not res Thank you, Flask. I appreciate that. Uh, but in the app here, can I run Sneak Code Test and see if it'll track it down? I really hope so. I really hope it says something funky because otherwise I, I, I built all this hype for now. Ooh, we completed. Okay, we've got uh, two code issues, one high and one medium. Ooh, command injection. Yep. App.py line 42. Unsanitized input from the HTTP response body or the request body flows into subprocess.run where it is used as a shell command. That may result in command injection. Yes, exactly. And debug mode is enabled. So it tracked that down and it found the source of how we could abuse this and it beat it all up. Even if it's weird and wonky, supplying the command injection as the file names of what you're uploading. Thank you so much to Sneak for sponsoring this video. Thank you for allowing me to co-host the Sneak Fetch the Flag with you. And again, if you have any interest in some of the other write-ups, there is a link in the video description. And if you want to see how Sneak can help find vulnerabilities, issues, problems in your own code projects and applications, link in the video description. They're great people. Always doing awesome, incredible stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, YouTube algorithm stuff, and I'll see you in the next video.